Welcome to the Brute Strength Podcast, bringing you worldwide experts from all areas of health and fitness. We cover training, nutrition, coaching, and mindset. Welcome your host, strength and conditioning coach, 2012 and 2013 CrossFit Games champ, Michael Cashew. Mind, body, brute. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Brute Strength Podcast. My name is Michael Cashew and my guest this week is Mike Robertson. He's the owner of Robertson Training Systems as well as the Indianapolis Fitness and Sports Training Facility. This one's a really special one to me because I can vividly remember being in at my first strength and conditioning job at Southern Utah University. I, ha- I worked really long hours and I didn't have a whole lot of friends. So in the little bit of time that I did have, I would just sit in my apartment and read articles online. And Mike Robertson wrote a lot of those articles that I became obsessed with in my early days as a strength and conditioning coach. And he, along with guys like Eric Cressy and Pavel and Dan John, were my early inspirations for being a strength and conditioning coach. So it was a huge honor to get to interview this guy. I think he's a he's one of the most technically sound coaches in the entire world. But one of the things that I was most interested in while interviewing him was diving into the more intangible parts of coaching. So we talked about how to prevent distractions and so you can do actually productive work. We talked about the importance of having the right personality and and specifically being able to connect with clients so that you can get buy-in and you can get them to actually follow through and stay on the program that you write for them. And I usually don't go much into the technical side of training, but because this guy was such a huge influence early on in my life, I brought up a couple of the the old articles, the old things that he taught about years ago. And a couple of those are how to use someone's rate of perceived exertion to write a training program. So how to basically allow for personalization within a training program. We know that not everyone's bodies work the same. We know that our no one's bodies feel feels the same on two different training days. And so this, this style of training allows for personalization. So whether you're writing an online program or you're training someone in person, this allows you to really customize the program to that athlete's needs. We also talk about something called anti-core training. And I tell the story of uh, the time that I first read that book and the impact it had, or not that book, that article and the impact that it had on me. We talk about breathing exercises that you can do post-workout to improve injury prevention and uh, alignment. And finally, we talk about his biggest recommendations and resources for program design, as well as the book that he's gifted most often. I learned a ton from this one, and it was a huge honor to get to interview one of the legends of strength and conditioning and one of the best uh, sports performance experts in the world. I hope you enjoy the show. Mike Robertson, what an honor, man. Uh, As I was telling you before the call, I... I've followed you for many, many years, and you were one of the biggest inspirations for me as a young coach. I, I, I'll talk about this later, but I remember vividly holed up in Cedar City, Utah, <laughs> reading Testosterone Nation articles that you had written, and it just, it just really captivated me, and, and I became obsessed with it because of guys like you. So thank you for making some time to do this, and I'm just really excited. Dude, that's that's a huge honor for me. Thank you for saying that. And, uh, man, it's always crazy. Like the days of me writing for T nation seems mm-hmm. so long ago. Um, you know, I know it wasn't that long ago, but it feels like forever ago, just, you know, the random stuff and the different places I've been in the fitness industry. So for, for me to have positively influence you, man, that means a lot to me. So thanks for saying that. Absolutely. Over the course of the, this interview, um, I want to touch on two kind of main areas on, on one hand, you're one of the most knowledgeable strength and conditioning ex- experts in the world uh, from a technical standpoint, right? The X's and O's, the the sets and reps, all of that kind of stuff. But you're also someone that I look at as a kind of just a wise person in general. You, you have a ton of experience with athletes, clients, et cetera. And 
I just love your philosophy on life and training in general. So I want to dive into some of the more intangible aspects of coaching as well. Sure. First, I notice that a lot of young coaches and, and myself included at times get distracted or even completely sidetracked by how much attention they're getting on social media and maybe even blogs and stuff like that. Yeah. And it's led to a, a lot of really half-assed coaching, right? Where they're more, <laughs> yep. they're more concerned about the attention they're getting than how many people they're impacting or how much they are impacting the people that they are already working with. What are your thoughts on social media in, in related to the fitness industry in general, um, both pro and con? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's something I struggle with internally a lot. Um, you know, obviously, I'm not that old, but at 39, the social media thing was not a thing when I was coming up. Um, you know, the only people we had to, to brag about were the other coaches that we were sharing a room with at the time, or maybe if we attended a seminar, we could talk about and trade some of our war stories. But, you know, it's a, it's a blessing and a curse because now there's so much ability to consume information, which is fantastic. There's almost no boundaries with regards to connecting and networking with other coaches, which is huge. You know, like back in the day, like you said, the people that you read, it was a lot harder to connect with them. And now they're a tweet away or an Instagram DM away. And, and so you kind of have to temper that enthusiasm, right? You have all this access to people and to information, but at the same time, you have to learn how to filter it, right? Because just because everybody has a voice doesn't mean everybody is equally wise right. and, and equally as seasoned in what they've done. So you have to kind of temper that enthusiasm. And, you know, when it comes to promoting yourself, um, you have to promote yourself, but I think there's like a really tasteful way to do it. And then there's like the over the top, look at me, you know, that kind of, uh, of, of ploy. And for me, I don't know, I, I guess I probably always err on the side of being understated. Um, and, and that's probably hampered me to some degree in my business. But I think if you're a young coach, just understand that you can't possibly know everything. You probably read a lot. You probably have a ton of knowledge. I appreciate that. So the way I always describe it is speak with authority, but also don't speak in absolutes. And I think that's a great rule, whether you're talking about social media, whether you're talking about promoting content or promoting information, whether that's on your blog, on a podcast, on you know, a YouTube video, whatever platform you're talking about, speak with authority because everybody wants to feel as though the person they're listening to is authoritative but don't speak in absolutes. And that's when people get into trouble. Um, and, and it's very easy to be black and white when you're young. And trust me, I was there. Like, I think about this a lot. When I was a young coach coming up, I thought I knew it all. I thought I had it all figured it out. And so there are probably times I spoke in absolutes when I shouldn't have. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's just a good piece of advice. Speak with authority, be authentic in your social media, but at the same time, never speak in absolutes and be willing to just say, Hey, you know, I don't know everything about this, but here's what I think, or here's what my experience up to this point has led me to believe. And if you speak in that way, then you can really never be wrong. Right. And I think that's just really important in this day and age is, is finding the right way to communicate via those mediums. I love that. It's uh, it's kind of like own what you're talking about so that people mm -hmm. will, will actually listen, including Absolutely. the fact that you don't know everything. Yes. That's one of the yeah. most refreshing things that you can hear from an expert is just the humility that, hey, I may have some of the answers, but I also there there's also a chance that none of it will be right in five or 10 years. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, absolutely. I, I met with a functional medicine doctor who basically told me the same thing. And he got he got my buy in more than any doctor ever has through that humility. You know, yeah. I, knew, I know that's real. Yeah. And, and, and people resonate with that. Right. Like, I think the point, like there's always going to be people that will just go for the quick fix or, you know, the easiest possible solution. But I think now we've kind of gotten through this point in social media where the people that are the most um, outgoing, the most in your face, like those people, just like in real life, they're starting to push people away. And now people are trying to find how to communicate in this new medium that is social media. And people are coming back to just, 
hey, man, I want to talk to somebody that's real and open and honest and authentic because I can jive. I can relate to that person versus kind of the blowhard know-it-all. Like nobody wants to be with that person in real life. And now they're kind of figuring out, okay, I don't want to be with this person in that social media environment either. I don't want to follow them. I don't want to spend or waste my time with that person. So I think that's just kind of where we're at in the whole social media game is it's really changing and it's evolving. You know, it's never going to be like real life, but it's getting closer to it. And I think people's filters are just dialed up because they're so tired of hearing, you know, from those types of people. Right. And I, I, I bring this topic up all the time because I am in that generation that just, yeah. it, it came, it came into play right, right at the, at the wrong time for me, right. When I was yep. a, a young coach, um, you know, young in my career in general. And it's, it's been really difficult to use social media without being used by it. And I've had to create a lot of structure and boundaries around social media just to, to, to get, be productive throughout my day. Right. Yeah. It, it's it is possible to have an entire day at work, you know, a nine to five job and get absolutely nothing done <laughs> because you spend your whole day looking through things that don't matter. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's definitely something where, like you said, you have to contain it, mm -hmm. right? So you find ways like maybe it's carving out certain times of the day when you do it, or maybe it's only after you've gotten X amount of work done. I mean, there's plenty of days where I'm just going to shut the Wi-Fi off. I'm going to go, there's a program for Mac. I don't use it anymore, but I used it in the past called Freedom. And it literally shuts your computer down other than like Word and PowerPoint. And so, man, it's literally like I go dark. The Wi-Fi is off. My phone is silenced. No notifications, airplane mode. Like it's full lockdown yep. for like an hour or an hour and a half. And here's the crazy thing. Like you really realize when you do stuff like that and you really just crush work for an hour, hour and a half, how much work you can get done when you're focused. So what took you eight hours before now you're getting done in 60, 75, 90 minutes and you feel amazing about yourself. So, I mean, that's just a huge, a huge piece of life advice. Like if you're constantly in this mode of distraction, right? Like you're constantly working on something and then you lose your train of thought and then you come back. I mean, I don't know if I always buy into this research, but they say every time you get distracted, that's 15 to 20 minutes. Mm -hmm but for you to get back on that train of thought and get refocused. So just imagine that times, you know, Slack notifications and text messages and phone calls and everything else. Like you can really dial it in and be productive. I mean, 60, 75, 90 minutes, that can be really powerful for you, not just, you know, in your work life, but in your social life, personal life, all that stuff. Right. I think about it like if when I'm writing an article or I'm, or I'm preparing for a podcast or even doing a podcast at times, I, I feel like I'm in a flow state and my mind is just on yep. overcharge, right? I feel like I'm sprinting. It's just effortless, but it takes time to get there. You, I don't just yep. sit down, start preparing and I'm in that mode, right? It yeah. takes 15, 20, 30 minutes to really get in there. And if I'm constantly checking things that are are buzzing on my phone or, or popping up as a notification on my computer, I can never get there, period. Yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, I read this time management article this was years ago and i don't know if this is where you want to go with this but like this article was so profound i read it probably 10 or 15 years ago and the guy was talking about he called it serial batching right so like doing all similar or like tasks at one time Huge so for instance yeah so like program design right we all know the first program you sit down and write man it's kind of like grinding you know like okay what exercise do i want to use where am i going with this person mm -hmm. But you write the first one and let's say it takes 20 minutes. Well, then the second one, maybe it only takes 13. And then the third is 10. It's like now you're just in that mindset. So it's a combination of batching those like-minded tasks, doing them all at the same time while eliminating distractions. You do those two things and, man, you can really crush and get some serious work done in a short period of time. Hell yeah. And that uh, Freedom, the, the software you talked about, they actually came out with an app that works on your phone and it'll oh, shut nice. down it'll shut down any app that you want. Yeah. It doesn't work really well with Facebook or Instagram, but they're they're working on it, I'm told. Yeah, yeah. Um going into some of those intangibles about about coaching. I've heard you talk about you would hire an employee at your gym based on personality a lot of times over their technical knowledge of strength and conditioning. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah, it's a hundred percent true because when it comes to training people, right? Like I've done everything 
And when I say everything, I'm talking rehab to high-end performance, one-on-one, small group, large group, private sector, public sector. I've done it all, right? And I think one of the only things that made me successful early on, it wasn't my coaching, right? It definitely wasn't my coaching because I had no clue what I was doing. It was the fact that I could always find some point of rapport or relationship building with every client or rehab person I worked with. I could always find that common ground for us to build a relationship off of. And now what's crazy, this is just mind blowing to me. Like there's research now that shows that like the emotional side of training may be more important than the actual mechanical side. So like going in the gym and cranking out the reps, the emotional side of it can influence the adaptation. Right. So the fact that I like you as my coach makes me get a better workout and it makes me get a better training adaptation than if I don't like you as a coach. So like that's mind blowing to me. So now there's just science to back this up. But coming back to the point, like if I have a coach that I want to work with, that is setting the stage for everything else. That person enjoys training at my gym. Now they're going to tell more people, oh, hey, I love iFast. I want them, you know, I want my friends to start coming to my gym because I love this coach. He's amazing. He writes these great programs. He takes great care of me. Like that is so much more important than the guy that, you know, can see, oh, this person has a five degree hip shift when they squat. So I, I need to fix that. You know, like having that ability to create a connection and build a relationship with a client is so much more important early on. And I firmly feel like if you have the people skills and any sort of a brain and you're curious at all, I can teach you how to be a great coach. Mm -hmm. Right. There's a system to what we do. I can show you the angles that you need to look at. I can show you the coaching cues that I want you to use when they're in different positions. But if you lack that fundamental skill, then ultimately I feel like your success in this field will be less than it should be. Another intangible aspect of coaching is the this idea of uh, them buying in, right? On yeah. one hand, some coaches just tell an athlete, okay, here's what you're going to do today. Go and do it. On the other hand, yeah. there are people that sit down with an athlete and explain an entire year-long uh, block of training that they're about to start on. Yeah. So how do you approach this with new athletes and how do you maintain buy-in over the course of your time with any given athlete? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think it really depends on the athlete in front of you, right? And, and you have your really analytical people. These guys and gals, they want to know everything about what you do. They want to know why you chose this set rep scheme, this exercise, this time under tension. So those people, for them to have buy-in, you have to really educate them step-by-step step on what you're doing, what your vision is, and where you want them to be. Versus there's other people, and whether it's their personality, whether it's that kind of pre-existing relationship they have with you, like they just kind of trust you. And so there's a time and, and place where they may ask a question like, why am I doing this? Or, you know, why do you want me to perform it in this way? And so in that case, they don't need as much explanation. And, and, you know, the reasoning can be different from person to person and time to time. But I think you always have to adjust that based on the person in front of you. Right. Um, but I'm always a big believer in. And you know this because you you followed some of my work, but like when it comes to programming, there's a reason for everything in the program. And if there's a reason for everything that you do in your program, then all those conversations are very easy. You know, it's very easy to have those discussions of that's why I chose this set rep scheme or this exercise because there's a rationale behind it. You get into trouble if there isn't a thought process behind it and you're literally just throwing up exercises right. you found on Instagram or YouTube. So I think... You know, it really depends on the person, but, you know, a lot of times I give them enough information for them to feel satisfied, for them to feel like I'm catering to their specific needs and goals, and then we just kind of go from there. Correct me if I'm wrong, but in my experience, I, I feel like men are more likely to want to understand why they're doing what they're doing. They're a little more skeptical and they and they need, yeah. to, you know, you to explain it. And women, and, and again, this is, there are definitely exceptions, but women are sure. more likely to want affirmations and motivation from you, right? Like you're yeah. doing a good job, you're on the right track, keep going, that kind of thing. Yeah. And our population at our gym is a little skewed just because we are a little bit more on the technical side, mm -hmm. I would say, than, you know, Joe Blow at whatever big box gym down the street. But yeah, I think by and large, you're correct. And I think 
you know, ultimately it just comes down to like, what does this person need to hear? What does this person need to understand? And, you know, sometimes it's short and choppy and it's a little bit of information. Hey, I think you need to do this, this, and this. And then there's other people. It's like, man, they want like your entire thesis statement on training and your, you know, one hour background on why you think this program is going to be best for them. So, and, and I, I like what you're saying by just being receptive to what that athlete needs. Right. And, and usually it's just as simple as just listening to what they're, what they're saying. A lot of times they'll tell you exactly what they want from you, but I think people get in trouble when they just make, when they're just rigid about the way they treat everyone. Right. They just have, yes. way and they're not flexible with it. Like they either, they always share everything up front or they just never do because you know, quote unquote, an athlete should just trust me. They should just trust yeah. the process. Right. Yeah. So this is, it's so funny you bring this up because I was literally just thinking about this today. I'm working with this gal and she's got like some body stuff, like movement wise that I really want to clean up. And I think it's ultimately holding her back from her goals. So her and I had like a heart to heart today on the gym floor. I'm like, look, so this is like a give and a take, right? So if your program is a hundred percent right now, you're getting 75% of what I think you need and you're getting 25% of what I know you want. And as we get you moving better, we can absolutely skew those numbers, right? So now two, three months, your body's moving better. We've got your hips, your core, your pelvis, where I want them. Once you're set, now we start to flip-flop that. And then it's 50-50. And then it's 25-75. And it's almost all what you want. I said, but you're coming to me as your coach, as an expert. And so I feel like if you want to move and feel the way that you want, if you want to have the body that you really are craving right now, we have to do this stuff first. And so if you kind of frame it in that way, then ultimately like people, if they're coming to you for coaching, they want your expertise. Right. So you have to find a way to, to create a common ground, kind of have this unifying goal. And the second it becomes me versus you, that's a bad situation right. to be in. So always, 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 um, if you're into, uh, kind of the marketing side of it, there's a, a group called story brand and they do a great job about, it's not about you, right? You're the mentor, you're the guide, they're the hero in their own story. So find a way to guide them to where they want to go. And I think that just really resonates with people in general. I love that. And this, this concept keeps popping in, into my head in relation to social media and this, where we have to take our egos out of it to really have a, a positive effect on people. And it's when, when coaches are, are, in this mindset that it's my way or the highway that they're just not effective. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and, and I think we all get to that point. Maybe, maybe not, but like, I think we come to this point where we do it for a little while and we've got our humility cause we're new and we're raw. And then we get to that point, I don't know, seven, 10 years in, we get kind of rigid for a little while. And then hopefully we have something that kind of kicks us in the pants and makes us realize, hey, like I don't know everything. And maybe you have to have a couple big failures or big mistakes. And then you're like, okay, maybe I do need to check myself a little bit here. And, you know, just because I've had success in the past doesn't mean I'm guaranteed to have success going forward. So I think that's a great point. Like there's just this ebb and this flow to this. And, you know, you constantly have to find a way to check your own ego at the door because at the end of the day, man, it's not about you. Right. It is not about you. It's all about them. And the second you can get down with that and really buy into that, that mindset, I think that's when you really set yourself up for success. And there's also something huge to be said for making sure the athlete continues coming to the gym or continues on the program because you can, they can be on the perfect, the absolute perfect program. But if they're not going to follow through with it, if they're going to quit because they don't like working with you, then it's absolutely worthless. So I love that kind of percentage breakdown that you brought up about, you know, 25% what they want. That might be literally the perfect program for that person at this moment in time. It's not yeah, necessarily yeah. what's best on paper. It's what's best, like what is best for that person at this moment in time. Yeah. I mean, I could give her a hundred percent of what I want and she'd be miserable, mm -hmm. right? Cause I know her personality type and I know how she, the gym is an outlet for her. Right. So that's why it wasn't, it wasn't just my way or the highway, but there had to be that discussion too. Right. Like I understand you. I, I, can respect where you're coming from. This is why I wrote it like this. And immediately 
Um, I said, when you're done today, cause she was working with a different coach. I just wrote her program. I said, text me and let me know. And she's like, man, this was awesome. She's like, it was a lot of what I know, what I wanted. It was a lot of what I know I needed. It was a great workout. So just the fact that I had expressed that to her and I'd given her kind of that understanding of why I did what I did immediately. There was more buy-in. She had a great session and I'm really stoked to see where she ends up with this. Enjoying this episode? Hit subscribe. We have more amazing content for you every single week. This episode is brought to you by ButcherBox. ButcherBox is an online meat subscription service that sends you some of the highest quality meats on the planet right to your doorstep. I've never brought a sponsor onto the show until now because it's always been really important to me that I never promote any product or service that I don't believe in or use myself. So this year, it was one of my biggest intentions to have more quality in my life. So higher quality movement, higher quality relationships, and higher quality nutrition choices. So I figure I'm gonna be eating meat every single day regardless, so why not eat it? Eat the highest quality meat I can find? And that's exactly what ButcherBox does. They send 100% grass-fed, pasture-raised, yes, super happy animals uh, that have never been given any antibiotics. Uh, animals that have been given a lot of antibiotics can really wreak havoc on our gut health. Here are some of the biggest benefits of eating grass-fed. It has higher levels of vitamins E, C, and beta carotene. There's more protein per ounce in grass-fed meat versus conventional meat. And it's going to improve the ratio of omega-6 to 3 uh, fatty acids in your in your body. And that's going to have a huge impact on the way that your brain functions, the way that nutrients get into your cell, and it's going to reduce systemic inflammation in your body that is uh, related and uh, has uh, is connected to a lot of different diseases and things like that later on in life. Grass-fed meat also has higher levels of CLA. Higher levels of CLA in your body improves your blood sugar levels, helps to fight cancer, and reduces your risk of heart disease. It also improves your ability to burn fat and improves your metabolism by modulating the hormones ghrelin and leptin in your body. That's what makes you uh, feel hungry or feel full. So it's a much, much higher quality meat. And in general, in my life, I'm just taking a very long-term uh, approach. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this as a very long-term approach. The choices that I make today, my nutrition choices that I make are going to have huge effects on me later in life. Right now I'm 27. I feel super, super healthy, no health complications, but I know, and I've been told by every expert that I've talked to that my nutrition today will impact me in 40, 50 years. So I have to start treating my body as well as possible right now. So that's why I'm choosing to eat grass fed. And it's just tastier in general. I don't know why that is, but it's a tastier cut of meat. It's higher quality all the way around. You can get a pretty cool discount if you go to butcherbox.com backslash brute, you get some free bacon, a free package of bacon and $20 off your first order. Enjoy. And with that, let's begin the show. I want to dive in a little bit to some some more technical stuff. Sure. So I'm going to start out with a couple older articles that you wrote and and see where that takes us, as well as a couple new things that I've come across while I started researching for this show. I saw a, an article a long time ago. Uh, it was a strength program on uh, the rate of perceived exertion, and yep. the way that you set it up is an athlete would do five reps. And if they felt like they could do two more, right, they would do as as heavy as possible. If they could do two more, then that was a score of eight. If they only had one left in the tank, it was a nine. And and if it was an all out max effort lift, then that was a, a zero. And this allows for some personalization, right? Some the ability yeah. to personalize your own program. Um, for for each athlete. Can you explain the rationale behind the rate of perceived exertion training and, you know, everything that goes into that? Yeah. So, you know, even early on, I realized that the weight never feels the same two days in a row. 
And to give you guys some background on me, when I was coming up, I was really into powerlifting. Like that was that was my way of going from college where I played a lot of intramurals and I played all kinds of sports growing up to that was my new competitive outlet as I kind of graduated college and as I was moving forward. So I got into powerlifting and I realized very quickly that, you know, 315, say on a squat feels totally different almost every day. But on your deload week, when you've been crushing yourself for three, four, five weeks in a row, 315 feels like a ton of bricks. So this was one of the issues that I always had with percentage-based training because a percentage-based program, you know, bases it off a, a max that you hit one time. Mm -hmm. And now we know that the research has shown us your max can vary 18% give or take on any given day. So whatever, you squat 400 one day, let's just make that 20%. That means your range is somewhere between 320 and 480 wow. on that lift, right? I mean, that's mind-blowing to think about that. And again, that's 20%, so I changed the numbers a little bit. But the, the concept is there, right? Like uh, when you follow a percentage-based program, you're taking into account – you're not taking into account the daily fluctuations, right? And – and another analogy that I'll use is when you come in the gym, you know, like let's say you got eight hours of sleep and you've ate perfectly for the last three weeks and everything's hunky dory in your personal life and you have no stress. Well, you're optimized. You're ready to train that day versus if you went out till three in the morning, you know, it was penny pitcher night at the bar. You just broke up with your girlfriend, your dog died. And then you go into the gym like the weights feel a lot different that day. OK, so that's why. Very early on, I tried to get away from percentage-based stuff. So RPE is a little bit harder because you have to be honest, right? And it is a subjective tool. But I love that because once you get comfortable with it, you are always modulating and optimizing your workout on that training day. So if you feel good, you know, an eight is, you know, maybe pretty heavy or it's maybe a new PR, even though you're not pushing that boundary, you know, versus on a day when you're really downtrodden and beat up, and eight's totally different, and that's okay, right? Because you optimize your training for that day. So that's the whole goal of RPE is really trying to, on a day-to-day -day basis, optimize the workout that you get. And it takes away some of the objectivity of using a percentage-based program, mm -hmm. you know, but ultimately I feel like, especially now, when we know what stress does to our body, you know, and it's not just physical stress, but mental stress, emotional stress, you know, if you're constantly beat up and you're constantly trying to push a certain percentage because that's what it says on the paper, that's when you get beat up or that's when you get injured. So I'd rather you be smart, optimize your training based on where you feel each day. And hey, the days you're beat up, hey, let's go light. Let's punch the clock. Let's get in the gym and move on. And the days you feel good, hey, those are the days we're going to hit the gas and see where you're really at. But for me, it's just something that always made sense, and it was kind of that that first big jump for me, moving away from a percentage-based program mm -hmm. and saying, hey, let's really optimize each training day, and it's made a huge impact with the clients and athletes that I've worked with. And that's one of the benefits of having a great in-person coach, right? Like the just the ability – a coach may write a percentage-based program, but they yep. always maintain the – the ability to be flexible, right? Based on how the w athlete walks into the gym, how they're feeling, everything like that. Yeah. And, and here's the other thing too, right? Like there is, there's a learning curve there, right? For somebody to be really honest about how many reps they have left. Mm -hmm. So the best part about having an in-person coach is I'm their immediate check. So if, if they're grinding a rep out and they're telling me that's an eight, like dude, Let's be real here. That was not an eight. That was like a nine and a half. Mm -hmm. We had 10 pounds to this bar and you're getting stapled. Okay. So that's another piece. And, you know, beyond just the check of how the weight looks, it's technical too, right? Because I mean, I know you're a competitive guy and you've done competitive CrossFit and everything else. Like, man, maybe, maybe the weight doesn't feel bad, mm -hmm. but technically it's not where I want it. Well, now I can check you there as well, right? Right, Because I know if your technique isn't where it needs to be, that's ultimately going to hamper or hold back your performance as well. Right. So, I mean, obviously tons of benefits of having an in-person coach, but those are just two with regards to kind of helping you choose the right load and optimize your training sessions. And that's called simple strength. You can find the, the whole, I think it's an eight week or 12 week program on T Nation. So simple strength, you can go find that for free online. The other, the other thing, this is, this is one of the first articles that I read of yours. And this was at a time when I was working at Southern Utah University, 
with uh, a, a bunch of different sports, soccer, track and field, gymnastics. And this was early on in my obsession for strength and conditioning. And, and I had one friend there who was also a strength coach. So he was super busy. So basically yeah. I, I, when I would get off of working, you know, 10, 12 hour days, I didn't have much else to do, but, but read on, online articles. Right. Yeah. And one, I, I vividly remember coming across your anti-core article. Oh, yeah. And it just, it was this huge light bulb moment for me. It wasn't, it, it's not any like cutting edge movements per se, but it's yep. a total paradigm shift on how we think about training the core. And to this day, I think that is the only way to think about training the core. Can you explain the, the basic philosophy and then how maybe a couple concrete things people can go out and do? Yeah. So let me give you the lead up to that first. So I came out of college with a, a master's degree in sports biomechanics. So we learn anatomy and we learn how the body moves. And so one of the things that I always took to heart was it made sense to me logically that if your spine can flex and bend and flex from side to side, so lateral flexion and rotate, that we should train all those movements. And as a young coach, I took that philosophy and I ran with it. And, you know, I mean, whether it was soccer players, volleyball players, football players, I kind of followed that approach the entire time. Now, when I got out of the, the division one setting, i moved into a rehab setting. And so it was a really huge shift. I mean, we're going from fairly healthy division one athletes to, you know, 40, 50, 60, even 80 year olds with bad backs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I had no clue what I was doing and I was very aware of that. Um, so I did everything that I could to start learning. And one of the guys that I came across was this guy named Dr. Stuart McGill and kind of a sharp guy, probably the world's foremost leader in spinal biomechanics. And, you know, he starts breaking down the core and, you know, shows this cross hatched web of muscles and says, you know, if your core was meant to just bend and flex, you'd have a hamstring. You wouldn't have this kind of interconnected set of muscles. I was like, wow, that really makes sense. So I start dabbling. I start playing around with this in the rehab environment. All of a sudden, my outcomes are getting so much better. So, you know, I start taking that. Well, if this works for rehab, does this work with our athletes as well? And it just makes sense. Like once you understand that the core is meant for stability versus creating motion, for me, this was a huge light bulb effect. And whether we're talking about, you know, low level back pain rehab patients or we're talking about elite athletes, like, great baseball players. Yeah, they might rotate a little bit through their lumbar spine, but the bulk of their, their rotation comes from their hips and it comes from their thoracic spine or their upper back. The core is essentially there to unify and connect the two. So once I understood that, it's like, okay, so I'm training flexion, extension, da, da, da. Maybe I should be focusing on preventing motion right. in all those different planes. So now I'm working on anti-extension or resisting extension, resisting flexion resisting lateral flexion, resisting rotation through the core. And man, that was just a huge game changer for me. And, you know, w one of the things that I found is not only are my outcomes going up as far as like my performance numbers and watching my athletes just perform visibly better, but my incidence of back pain is almost non-existent, you know, because now the core and the lumbar spine, the pelvis, they're actually in the right position mm -hmm. where I need them. And I think it was McGill, maybe it was Levinson, Gray Cook, one of those very smart people, but they basically said uh, distal stability, meaning core stability, unlocks proximal mobility. And so quite simply, that means, you know, you got your core, your lumbar spine, it's there to kind of stabilize and keep things in the right position so that your big ball and socket joints, your hips, your shoulders, you know, tons of freedom movement so they can unlock your athleticism. Mm -hmm. And once I, I heard that, I was like, that's it. That's what I need to be doing. And ever since I haven't looked back. That's huge. One, one analogy and correct me if I'm off base, I, I, I owe an apology to a lot of people if this is wrong, because this <laughs> is the analogy that I've used for years, uh, is the, is the idea of a linebacker hitting a lineman, right? A linebacker doesn't want to hit a lineman and then their shoulders get thrown back and they kind of twist around while they're trying to get to the quarterback, right? They yep. hit the lineman and they want their trunk to stay in the exact same position so they can continue applying force to that lineman and, and blow past them, right? Yeah. So it's this idea of resisting the rotation 
which means you should train in that same way. So do do things with your other limbs while maintaining a neutral spine. Yeah, can you, the way I always describe it is, can you maintain your core integrity while you're moving through your legs, through your arms, while you're creating, you know, these different lever systems that are constantly challenging and trying to force you to flex or extend or rotate. And if you can do that, now you've got a truly resilient and robust core. Now, I love the, one, one thing I, I, another kind of aha moment for me was, coming across the joint by joint approach that Mike Boyle talks so much about and, and yep. Gray Cook as well. And yeah. it's this idea that, you know, our, our body goes through, um, I don't know, I don't know what the right word is, but mobility and stability as the, as it goes up the body, right from the foot yeah. to the ankle, to the knee, to the hip. And, but every single joint does need both. And so yeah. in relation to the spine, we're talking about creating uh, stability about the spine. I've also heard this, this phrase used often that we're only as young as our spine and that yeah. we actually, we do need some mobility in the spine. What are your thoughts on that in general? And if, if you're a fan of that, what are, what are some good resources to learn about creating mobility at the spine if we're, if we're kind of yeah. locked up? So it's a great question. And I would say that you absolutely, here's what we've seen, like as amazing as Stuart McGill is, whenever there's somebody that's really brilliant at what they do, there's people that follow them that take it too far. Okay. So Stu McGill says, yes, we absolutely want a neutral spine. That's going to help spare our spine. It's going to help us, you know, load our hips more effectively, all good stuff. But then you have people that think, well, Stu McGill says, and what he actually says is, if you get to in range flexion and you load it, that's the, the most likely place to herniate a disc in, in your back, mm -hmm. right? So like think a power lifter gets totally rounded over with a max weight. That's a position that they would herniate a disc. So people extrapolate that and they think, oh, well, if that's bad, then I don't want to flex my spine ever, right? Right. Well, that's not good because now we've got all these people walking in. They literally can't even reverse their lumbar curve. You know, we're trying to get them to touch their toes or they're doing something passive and easy like a cat camel. They can't even do it. OK, so this is where you can follow the joint by joint approach or something of that nature. But you ultimately have to respect the fact that there's a certain amount of mobility and stability every joint. You alluded to that. So when it comes to your spine, do I want to grossly round when I squat or deadlift? Absolutely not. That's not a position that's going to be conducive to moving heavy weights or staying healthy. But with that being said, if you can't bend over and touch your toes when you're just standing there, that's probably a problem too. So as far as your second question, which was how do you mobilize that area? You know, I don't know if this is the coolest answer, but like one of the biggest things that, that we focus on at our gym is just retraining breathing mechanics. So if somebody's very extended where their rib cage is popping up, their pelvis is tipped really far forward, they got a big curve in their lumbar spine, mm -hmm. a lot of times we're just going to put them in different positions and try and get them to get a full exhale. Okay, because what you find is when people are really stuck in that extended position, it's a position of inhalation. Mm -hmm. So until we can get all that air out of their body, that exhalation drives a flexion of the body in general, right? We would call it systemic flexion. So you get all the air out, the system itself kind of flexes, and then that allows you to increase your mobility through your spine. So it's not so much a mobility thing as it is a, hey, can we get you to exhale, which unlocks the natural mobility that your body has. So I'm not sure if that makes sense, but a lot of people think they need a new mobility drill. No, we just need to put you in the right position mm -hmm. via an exhale so that you can optimize or unleash the mobility and the athleticism that you already have. Right. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I, I know okay. that you're a big fan of putting those after the warm up specifically. Yep. Can, you, yeah. can you describe maybe one particular, uh, one particular exercise that you'll have people do? Yeah. So I'll send you a link too, and, and you can throw it in the show notes if that works for you. But um, I love putting people in a position called hook line. So if you imagine you're laying on your back, you put maybe like a small like uh, aerobic step or one of those small Reebok boxes underneath your feet. So your, your knees and your hips are flexed, but your feet are resting on this box. So they're up maybe 
two to three inches above your butt, right? And then you're going to reach up over your chest. And then you can hold a kettlebell if you want, but literally you're just going to camp out in this position. You're going to inhale through the nose and you're going to exhale fully. You're going to reach long and you're going to think about trying to find your heels. So what this does, it turns on your abs, it turns on your hamstrings, it corrects and kind of repositions your pelvis to a more neutral position. And if your pelvis is neutral, generally your lumbar spine is going to be in a little bit more optimal position. So we'll go foam rolling. We'll do a reset or two like this exercise, and then we'll go into our warm-up. And what that does is, again, it kind of helps optimize our position. So when we go into our warm-up, now we're grooving these really clean movement patterns. We're a little bit more mobile. We're a little bit more supple, as Kelly Sturrett would say. Mm -hmm. And now we're grooving these clean patterns. So when we go in, now we can squat or deadlift or run or jump at a really high level. And we're moving much more effortlessly. So that's one of my favorites. Like I said, I'll send you a link. Um, it sounds really complex. When you look at the video, you're going to be like, is he even doing anything? But I guarantee if you get in this position, you work on getting all that air out of your body, you're going to feel your abs, your hamstrings, they're going to light up and your back's going to shut off. And when you stand up and you start moving, you're just going to be shocked at how free your movement feels. Hell yeah. Yeah, guys, we'll, we'll definitely link that in the show notes. Uh, when I, when I, was recovering from my lumbar fusion. I worked with a guy who was a former uh, New Orleans Saints physical therapist. His name was Andre yep. LeBay. Okay. Brilliant guy. One of his biggest things, one of his biggest recommendations for me in my recovery was the inclusion of animalistic movements in really every single day, right? I could, I, yeah. I couldn't load I couldn't do anything under load for about six months, but about yeah. two to three months post-op, I could, I could move around. I could, you know, do some locomotive type stuff on the ground, right? Uh, bear yeah. crawls, crab walks, frog type stuff in, in yeah. all different directions. Yeah. What are your, what, what's your opinion of animal movements? Do they, do they play a role in your programming? And if so, where? Yeah. So I think, I think, for me, I don't, I don't think of it in that fashion, but we absolutely use it, right? Like we've got all kinds of different bear position exercises. Um, for me, it all comes down to, does this put me in a position that is going to give me either a direct benefit now or an indirect benefit down the line? So say a bear crawl, like we talked about the extended client uh, a few minutes ago. If somebody's got this huge rib flare, anterior tilt. The second I put them on all fours, now they have to reach. It's going to drive their rib cage back. It's going to get them to flex their spine a little bit again. It's going to get them not only in this reaching position that gets everything stacked, but now we're teaching the core and the hip flexors to work together synonymously again. And I think hip flexors are one of those muscle groups. Everybody, oh, you got to stretch them. You got to stretch them. Well, they're just on because you're in bad positions all day, mm. right? And they're problematic because you don't have any abs to offset them. So tying abs and hip flexors together in a more functional way, I think is actually really valuable. So I think anything too, where you're just driving load, um, in a body weight fashion and getting people to work on like alternating or reciprocating functions. Um, it's gait, right? It's gait in different positions. And I think that's really valuable. It's stuff that we do a ton with our young kids because now, I mean, Maybe you'd be shocked. Maybe you wouldn't. I mean, we have kids that look amazing when you put a bed ball in their hands mm -hmm. and you have them throw it, but they can't skip. They right. can't bear crawl. So we do a lot of that with our younger kids um, to just build their movement vocabulary. And then there's absolutely times with our higher level athletes, especially if they're really wound up, if they really struggle to flex their system or if they struggle to get into the right positions, we'll absolutely use that stuff as well just because it's – I think the biggest benefit of it for older clients and athletes is the fact that it's unique or it's novel, right? And they can't equate it to, I need this much load for this to be successful. Right. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like so many guys just have this thought of, if it's a squat, if I'm not doing 315 or 400, it's not worth my time mm -hmm. versus this very quickly. They're like, holy cow, like I'm just using my own body weight and I'm just like sweating buckets, Right. you know? So Absolutely. I think there's a role for it. You just have to figure out, you know, what is the end goal of having it in your program and what do you want to get out of it? And if you can answer those two questions or check those boxes, then by all means, I think it's a great addition to your program. 
It's great advice. Talking about program design, there's so much free information uh, on different websites, yeah. on testosterone nation, different eBooks, free online, but there are very, there are very few systems that I would trust, yeah. right? Uh, a system for how to put all of that information together. What, yeah. are, what is your number one or even a couple of resources that young coaches can go out and learn how to design training programs in a systematic way that makes sense long-term? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to give you a shameless plug here to start. Do it. Um, the, the, the physical prep 101 product that I created, I literally created because for like 12, no, 13 years, I've written stuff online. I'd created products and people were like, if I could buy one of your products that covered all your basics on program design and coaching, what would it be? And I didn't have an answer for it. So literally I created an entire seminar that was just, look, if you have no familiarity with my system, here's a whole day on program design. Here's a whole day on coaching. So I think the program design 101 product that I created is pretty darn good. Now I want to give you a couple influences to me. Um, very early on, I was introduced to another guy, uh, that wrote for T nation called Ian King. And he is like, I don't know, hold up somewhere in Australia now, brilliant guy. Um, and somebody that I learned a ton from as a young coach. And he's very analytical, almost like an engineer in the way that he looks at program design, the way he thinks of, this is where I want an athlete to be. This is where they're at and then reverse engineering the whole process. So he's got some books and, and materials on that that were really influential to me. Um, you know, I think the hard thing for me is I've read a bunch of little things along the way, but I never had a great mentor to teach me program design. So I kind of cobbled together and created my own system. Right. You know, but there's like you said, there's so many free resources out there now. Um, you know, if you've got the time, by all means, like figure out who you jive with, pull from them, um, and then kind of cobble together your own system. But, you know, I hate to shameless plug myself, but I think the Program Design 101, or excuse me, the Physical Prep 101 DVD series gives you a lot of good information. It's, it's multiple lectures on kind of how I started, you know, what we call the R7 approach, and that's kind of our 30,000 foot view to program mm -hmm. design, and then we just drill down from there into sets, reps, rest periods, time under tension, all those nitty gritty details and how you take that and just modulate that based on the end goal or the adaptation you're trying to create with your client or athlete. Right. I love that. Uh, some advice that I always give people that email me and ask me the same question is find someone in your area that you can just go and volunteer with or intern under, yeah. right? Go, go yeah. work with someone that is in the trenches working with athletes. They've already made a thousand mistakes and they've figured a lot of things out and just download that information that they, that they're using right now, right? Go, yeah. go work with Mike Robertson, go work, you know, volunteer for Mike Robertson, volunteer yeah. for Eric Cressy or a local college. Like that's, that's a lot of the, the best strength and conditioning professionals professionals in the country are just working at small colleges, working with yeah. teams. You, you couldn't be more right. And it, it brings us to a greater point of the need for mentors in our industry. You know, like it, it comes back to the, the social media, which is so curated and methodical and plotting versus man, go and see a great coach and see, you know, yeah, they're going to get a lot of wins in a day, but they're going to have a couple failures as well. Mm -hmm. And, a great coach is going to learn more from those failures than all the wins combined. Yep. Right. Because those things are those challenging clients. Those are the ones where you really learn and you grow and evolve as a coach. So I, I can't stress that highly enough. That's amazing advice. Like you have to find somebody to go out and work with hands on. And I, there's no replacing that. I mean, I, I would love to, I wish there was a different way, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm kind of at a point now where I'm kind of locked in I got two businesses. I've got a family. Like I can't go somewhere for an extended period of time and just hang out. Right. So yeah, if you're a young coach listening to this, if you're untethered, no relationships, no commitments, man, take this time now, go out and find a really good mentor to study and learn from. Because if nothing else, even if you don't take everything that they give you, they'll give you one thing that you won't get probably on your own. And that's yep. a filter. You'll have a filter to, to distinguish and distill all the other information that's coming your way. And that is so, so valuable these days. Right. 
And you should probably really never take everything that someone gives you, right? You should always be looking to put your own spin on it. And especially in regards to you're, you're working with unique, you know, players and individuals. So they're going to need something different than what your, what your mentor has given you. So just go in there with the mindset of take what you take, what you like and leave the rest. Yeah. It's, it's literally the Bruce Lee quote. I mean, I don't remember it it, verbatim, but it's like absorb what is useful, reject what is not make the rest your own. And I think ultimately that's what every, every great coach does. And, And that's, you know, the unexciting part about the internet. Like I think if you interviewed all of the best coaches, you know, somehow we figured out who the hundred best coaches were, they'd probably agree on about 90 to 95% of the stuff. You know, it's the five to 10% that we disagree on, or that maybe we look at through a different lens that people want to blow up and magnify on social media or on the internet, like the basics and the tried and true stuff. That's like 90% agreeable and universal across the board. What's something that you've changed your mind about in the past couple of years? Hmm. I don't know if there's something I've necessarily 100% changed my mind on, but I've definitely evolved greatly in say the last five years. And coming back to the idea of powerlifting, right? I always thought of myself as somebody that could look at other people's goals and not intertwine them with my own, right? But looking back, say, especially say 13, 14 years ago when I was getting started, you know, I thought squatting, benching, and deadlifting were like the best things for everybody. So, oh, you want to powerlift? Well, we squat, bench, and deadlift. Oh, you want to be a good athlete? Well, we squat, bench, and deadlift. Oh, fat loss? Perfect. Squat, bench, and deadlift. Like I build everybody's programs around that. So, you know, it's been this constant evolution over 13 to 14 years, but I think I'm now at a point with the athletes that I coach, and I just understand it's not about the exercise at all. For me, it's all about the adaptation, right? And so I don't care how we get the adaptation. I don't care if we squat, if we jump, if we throw a med ball, if we push a sled. doesn't matter to me. It's all about the adaptation, and it's all about the transfer. You know, it's all about the transfer. Does this make you run a faster 10? Does this help you improve your vertical jump or increase your power output or your force output? And, you know, if we can check those boxes, then I feel very comfortable with where I'm at. And it's, you have to be at a certain place as a coach, I think. And, and hopefully the young coaches coming up will never have to be where we were. But as young coaches, so many of us hung our hat on, oh, well, Colin squatted 550 in the spring and now he's squatting 600 in the fall. I checked the box of I'm a good coach yep. because I made him stronger. Now it's like, I don't care what Colin squats. Maybe he only squats 495, but he does it in half the time and he's destroying dudes when he comes off the line. You know, so I think, I don't know if I've necessarily changed my mind, but I've definitely evolved as a coach over the years and just moved away from, you know, a place of comfort for me, which was the weight room to a point of, you know, less knowns, more complexity, but ultimately, Hey, if I'm getting the adaptation that I want, I don't care what means I use to get there. It's all about getting the adaptation and making a better athlete. Right. I think it goes back to how we started about taking your own ego out of the out of the scenario. And I think the faster you can get in a mindset like a just think really long term, the faster you can get in a mindset of doing what's best for the athlete rather than what's best for you, the more successful you're going to be long term without fail. Yeah, it, yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. It, it just comes down to, you know, doing what's best by them. And something that I've I've really come to grips with the, like the last three to four years is that I am very much a servant in my own life. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but like when I go into the gym, I'm a servant to the clients and athletes that I train. And it's it's not in a negative way. It's not in a pandering way, but I'm there to serve them and to do whatever I can to give them the best outcome. And the second I got on board and 100% okay with that, it's been so cool to see kind of the growth and the evolution of the relationships that I've had with my clients. So nowadays you're, you're working from everyone from, you know, probably people's moms and grandmothers to the most elite athletes on the planet. How did you gain credibility along the way? Like where, where did you kind of start? And then how did you, how did you gain the respect to be able to work with the best athletes on the planet? 
Yeah. So I think part of it was I've always been open to training anybody and everybody, especially from the start. And I think as a young coach, it's very easy to say, well, I want to train pro athletes and you're not satisfied unless you do, but that's the wrong way to look at it. Because again, some of like the 60 and 70 year old clients that you have to modify and adapt and they don't move well and you have to give them different coaching cues. Those are the people that really make you a great coach. So that when you get with that high end elite athlete, now it's really just a matter of, do you have the swagger and the juice? So that when they ask you something, boom, you've got an answer for them. Um, so for me, it was that evolution of, I got super comfortable training anybody and everybody. So that like probably the highest level athlete that I got early on in my career was Roy Hibbert when he was playing for the Pacers. And I mean, look, they were like in the Eastern conference finals the guy was very high profile. He's seven, two. So, I mean, he can't walk down the street without somebody recognizing him. Yeah. He's huge. And I mean, look, he was just an absolute monster. So, you know, when that time came around, you're always going to be nervous, you know, and, but we got demonstrable results with him. And I take no credit for their natural athleticism for the fact that he's seven, two, you know, I can't, I can't take credit for any of that. But if you look at how that guy, especially how we started off his year, the first three or four months of that year, gangbusters. And so then, you know, that athlete talks to another athlete or, you know, other coaches notice the results you got with that athlete, because at the top level, it's not like they're just soliciting advice on the internet. Oh, Hey, so-and-so needs a trainer. Like it doesn't work like that. It's, it's a phone call between trusted people. Like, Hey, man, I saw the results you got with this guy. Can you help my guy? You know? And so that's how things work. So you always need a break. It's like, uh, it's like the music business. You got to have a break at some point, you know, you play an amazing show in front of the right guy and then the exec wants you or they want to sign you to their label. It's the same thing. You know, you put in the work, you get really comfortable working with the average Joe or the, the, the high school kids or the college kids so that when your time comes, when that opportunity comes, your opportunity meets with preparation and now you can really kind of put everything on display. But you need a break and then you got to, you got to, you know, do really good work when you get your break, you got to show them what you got. And then that tends to open doors going forward. And furthermore, put everything, put everything you have into every athlete that you work with or every client that you work with, because you're either practicing for that perfect client that you really want to work with, or the, that average Joe you're working with is going to refer that, yeah. that client that you want. I've had, I've had like, businesses start that way. I've gotten amazing clients that way just by yeah. working with, you know, a mom or, or, or dad. Yeah. One of my good friends in this industry, Joe Ken, he's the uh, strength coach for the Carolina mm-hmm. Panthers. He always says the best job is the one you got. Yep. And, and so often, and, and I am not, I am not one to, to bash any age group, but you know, a lot of people throw millennials under the bus and they say, oh, well, they're just focused on, you know, what's what's coming up in the future. They're not in the present. They're focused on, you know, what's coming up. And it's like, man, that's that's universal. There's a lot of people at every age range that are focused on the next job or where they're going. It's like, man, be really great where you're at. Do great work where you're at and people will find you. Yep. Like, that's what I always tell people. And, you know, and again, that's universally true. Right. Like these these parents of young kids that come into our gym and they say, well, I want little Johnny to be seen, you know, so he's got to do these 10 showcases this year. It's like, man, if little Johnny's good enough, some scout's going to find it. Right. Like people get paid a lot of money to find talent. And the same thing is true in this industry. If you're great at what you do, if you're putting in amazing work, if you're preparing yourself, you know, Hey man, you put in great work now, I guarantee three, five, 10 years down the line, you're going to get rewarded with the job you know, that maybe you're a little bit more excited about or that really takes you to the next level. I think that's one of the keys to life in general, because I, a mentor of mine told me years ago that in in terms of intimate relationships, always, always treat a relationship like the person you're in it with is the one, right? Because if they're not, then they're just practice for the one. Yeah. So treat everything you're doing as it's, it's the most important thing you can possibly do. Because why, why not else, right? You're, you're, you're building skills. You're, you're learning how to form relationships. All of those things are relevant for like the highest version of yourself. So you might as well give it everything you've got. I, I love that philosophy. Yeah. And, and it comes back to like I coach, 
I coached a lot of my daughter's youth sports, like six and seven year old girls. And so like we had our first basketball practice last week and part of the practice is we talk about life skills. So we talked about the golden rule comes back to the golden rule, right? If you're paying somebody else your money, you want them to give you a hundred percent, right? Mm. Like why would you give somebody 50% when they're paying you whatever you're worth? Like that's just such a messed up thing. Like I'm always going to bring my a game and I was, oh, would always say, it's like, I don't care if I have one guy in the group or six or 10 or 12. And I don't care if it's a high school girl, you know, who just wants to maybe play in college or a professional athlete. You're going to get my A game regardless of who you are and where you're at. Because it's more about me feeling good about the work that I'm doing versus you feeling good about the work that I'm doing. And I know that's kind of a flip-flop from what we talked about earlier. It's like, I always want them to know that I care about them, that we've got a relationship. But at the end of the day, I sleep well every night knowing that I'm giving every client, every athlete, Mm -hmm. my best effort every session. Right. All right, I've got a few rapid-fire questions for you, and then we'll wrap it up. I love it. What book have you given away as a gift most often? Ooh. Or or would you recommend most? Yeah, uh, okay. Can I give more than one? Yes. I'll give you a couple. Um The Obstacle is the Way. Oh. Fantastic. Language. Yeah. Obstacle is the way is fantastic. I've given that to a handful of athletes um that were either struggling at certain times um in their career, whether it was maybe a lack of playing time or injuries. So God, there's just so many good things so about that good. book, right? So the obstacle is the way is one. And then the other one that I've given um, very frequently is the slight edge. Nice. Yeah. Right. It's just, it's one where, okay, hey, man, not every day is a home run, you know, but man, I'm going to keep chipping away. I'm going to do the little things every day. And those little like micro things that you do every day, consistently day in and day out, prepare you for game day or the big presentation or whatever, the big opportunities in life. If you've done all the preparation leading up to that, damn it, you're ready to go when game day hits. You're primed for the opportunity. Absolutely. What's a belief that you hold that if others held would have the biggest effect on their life and or performance in general? To give 100% in everything that you do. And that can be... I don't know. That can be wishy-washy, but I truly mean that. So it's like, man, if you're at work, be all in at work, you know, and when work is done and you go home, be all in at home. Um, and I think that's something we all strive for, right? It comes back to social media and distraction and everything else, but man, find ways to be a hundred percent in and truly present in everything that you do. And I think you'll find that all of your relationships in life and all of the work that you do in life, and again, whether that's at work, at home, um, on yourself is so much more valuable and so much more rewarding as a result. I don't think it's wishy-washy at all. That's one of my, my strongest held beliefs actually. And I think it has a, a lot to do with our integrity with ourselves, right? We can be, we can kill it in the gym, but if we're, we're, if we're half-assing it in our relationships and our career, then there's a part of ourselves that says, I'm, I'm a fucking piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. I'm not worth yep. it. I'm going to fail at some point. And if you don't think that's the case, I think you're wrong, right? I think yeah, it's just a matter of time and, and it just kills your self-esteem and confidence, whether you're aware of it or not, how you do anything is how you do everything. And so I, yep. I couldn't agree more. Cool. Cool. What's one action that you'd recommend people take immediately? I would advise that everybody who listens to this, stop thinking about home runs and start hitting singles every day. Okay. So, so for me, and I'll give you some practical stuff, a little story first. So this last year I went to Poland for a speaking engagement and leading up to that, man, I was crushing it like every area of life, right? Like training, business, meditating, all of it. And I don't know what happened. I came back off that and I was in a funk. Um, You know, so like the last six weeks of the year, I was just kind of in a haze, wasn't super productive. So I'm not a New Year's resolution guy. So I started a couple of days before, but like I just said, look, I'm just punching the clock on these things, right? Like I'm going to meditate every day. Mm -hmm. I'm going to train in air quotes five days a week. And sometimes that's in the gym in a full session. Sometimes it's literally 10 minutes before my kids get on the bus but I'm just going to build those habits, right? I'm going to do a little bit every single day. And for me, it's like the momentum and the inertia is 
so impactful right now. Like I feel like I'm really hitting on all cylinders. So, and it comes back to that slight edge principle, right? Do a little bit every day, you know, focus, put a little bit of time and attention into those things every day that are most impactful in your life. And if you check those boxes every day, you make those habits, you build those routines, man, you're going to be shocked at where you're at in just a couple of weeks, let alone a couple of months. Stop shooting for home runs and start hitting singles every day. Singles every day, baby. Small ball, small ball every day. What's one thing that you've stopped doing that's most contributed to your success? I've stopped allowing distraction to really blow up what I want to get done in life. Um, so again, it just keeps coming back to this idea of being present in what I'm doing. Right. And sometimes look, I'm no stronger mentally than anybody else that listens to this show. Right. So for me, it's like, I have to put constraints on myself. It's, shutting off the alerts. It's turning off my phone. It's carving out an hour of time. And it comes back to our topic of integrity, right? So if I say, man, I'm going to work on this PowerPoint for an hour when I get off this call, damn it, I'm going to work on this PowerPoint for an hour when I get off this call. Um, and so it's consistently finding ways to put constraints on yourself to allow yourself to be truly successful. And if you read people that are like into routines, whether that's getting up early or daily routines, morning routines, whatever, it's all about kind of just putting constraints on yourself, creating these rituals and these routines so that you can ultimately be more successful right. in the long run. And I'm sure anybody that listens to this can, can get behind that idea. It's like, man, put constraints on yourself, figure out ways to put yourself in a position to be successful so that ultimately you can achieve what you want to achieve in life. You did not, um, you did not disappoint. Okay, good. You're one Glad of to the, hear that again, one of the most technically knowledgeable coaches in the world and the history of strength and conditioning. And you're just a, you're just a wise man. <laughs> And well, thanks, gonna, man. I, people are going to learn a shitload from this. So thank you so well, much, man. I truly appreciate it. And uh, if you listen to uh, the last hour, hopefully you took a thing or two away from it. Hell yeah. Where can people find out more about your training programs, um, your podcast, all of that? Yeah, the best place is just Robertson training systems dot com. Um, tons of information there. Uh, weekly blog. Sometimes it's new stuff. Sometimes it's old stuff. There's tons of videos that I've created. Some are coaching videos. Some are just shorter, like demo type videos. And I've got the podcast there as well. So kind of my goal is that every week I'm going to push out three pieces of training related content that are going to make you a better trainer, a better coach, or a better athlete. So that's the best place. And uh, if you're interested in the physical prep product that we mentioned earlier, it's physicalpreparation101.com. Awesome. Thank you so much, coach. Appreciate your time. Man, my pleasure. Thanks again for having me. Thank you for listening to this week's episode. Your journey towards better fitness continues. Head over to BruteStrengthTraining.com to connect with Michael and his guests. Access links and resources mentioned in this episode, as well as bonus content exclusive to podcast listeners. That's BruteStrengthTraining.com. 